Let's welcome Vivek to our session for the talk, next talk. And uh, just to briefly introduce him, Professor Vivek Sharma is from the University of uh, California and San Diego. So I think it's quite late for him. I assume he's in US time zone. Professor Sharma is an experimental particle physici physicist and his interest spans across the searching for news about atomic particles, physics of big quarks, electroweak physics, and Higgs physics over the last few decades. So you can see the long interest and long span. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society for almost two decades now. And he actually has a stunning list of discoveries to his credit, which starts with the BS and Lambda B particles at the LF experiments at the lab. And his group played an important role in the first observation of CP violation in the decays of neutral B bosons at the Bauer experiment. And he was the uh, coordinator of the Higgs physics group of the CMS during 2010 to 2011, which was the most crucial time for the preparing for the Higgs discovery. And since then, he has been involved with measurements of several properties of the Higgs boson. So he's presently also responsible for the Higgs section of the PDG database, which reviews all the results and documents them. So today he will tell us about the story of discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC. And you all know that wherever he goes, he has a discovery. So make sure to catch him if you want to discover something in your group. <laughs> please go ahead, Vivek. Uh, Vivek, please tell me whenever you want to take a pause and ask for the questions. Otherwise, we continue. Uh, you, you, if you, you can interrupt me at any time. Okay, perfect. Um, so let, let's try to keep, make it interactive. Uh, it's, th thank you, Seema, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it, it's true that I just happened to be in the right places at the right times, and and I had a fun uh, twenty-five years of uh, of discoveries. Um, this talk on the discovery of the Higgs boson is is I'm targeting it towards uh, the young scientists in the audience uh, who were still in high school at the time of the discovery, and uh, and and uh, so they may not have a, a sense of what it was like the, the 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 period leading up to the discovery, how hectic it was, how simply exciting it was um, and in an online talk like this I, you, it is very difficult to to uh, give a sense of that excitement but uh, but I'm going to I'm going to try and show you some of the ups and downs and some of the surprises that came our way uh, in the path to the Higgs discovery um, okay so can you see my slides yes Okay. All right. So, uh, and also thank you very much, uh, uh, Rohini, for uh, a wonderful talk and uh, for setting up the theory of, uh, of the Higgs boson. And so I'll be light on that. Um, and I'll just take an experimental perspective, uh, which is that we knew nothing uh, from theory about uh, uh, the Higgs mass. Okay. And uh, at, before the start of the LEP E plus C minus program in 1989, uh, there were searches for uh, for Higgs boson, but none of them were model independent. As a matter of fact, if you look at phenomenological profile of uh, the Higgs boson by uh, Ellis et al., they have a table which shows you different places where searches have been made, and many of them have a question mark around them. Uh, implying that that these are model dependent results. So LEP uh, was the place where Higgs via its production in E plus C minus interaction as a as a Higgs straw lung where Higgs was emitted off a of a Z. Uh, and this was the dominant uh, uh, process and uh, with, with small contributions from WW fusion uh, like shown over here. One of the most exciting days, I was there at the at the start of LEP, and one of the most exciting things, or exciting papers that we wrote was when we ruled out a Higgs boson with a mass of zero GeV, okay? And that's where the LEP uh, uh, hunt for the Higgs started, from zero. And uh, by the end of uh, LEP2, um, LEP produced a, an upper bound of 114.4 GeV 
which is essentially the kinematic limit of uh, the the maximum lap energy minus this mz that is that is produced here so that was the 95% confidence level towards the end there was some excitement about uh, uh, a uh, a few events at around 115 GeV, which caused some drama about uh, whether LEP should run longer. But uh, I think, um, as we now retroactively know, uh, in retrospect, that uh, it was a good good decision to shut down LEP in November 2000 to make way for LHC. Now LHC has been a long time in planning. Uh, this is a, a table from uh, a, a, a annual review of nuclear particle sciences article by uh, Michel de la Negra and, uh, and uh, Professor Verdi, who you will hear from, um, on, on, on the timeline of, uh, let's see, development and CMS atlas construction. Uh, there are many steps, as you can see here. You can ask yourself where you were in 1984 when the first workshop on on the Large Hadron Collider at LEP Tunnel, uh, which was a idea from Steve Myers, uh, happened. But there were four major years in this timeline. 1994, the LHC accelerator is approved. In 1994, yes. And in 1996, Atlas and CMS technical proposals are approved. And they actually have evolved a lot from the time that these were approved to the time that these detectors were actually built. Next major highlight was uh, uh, in 2008 when LHC experiment were ready for PP collisions and circulated a beam of uh, protons around the whole LHC ring. Um, but then very shortly um, an incident stopped the LHC operation and uh, finally in 2010 or actually late 2009 uh, when the recommissioning of LHC with a uh, with a very sophisticated magnet protection system and and and, and sensitive monitoring um, uh, the LHC started again at 7 TeV not at the nominal 14 TeV um, and then so on and so forth. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm basically going to cover this part of the story, which is the Higgs discovery. Now at LSC, as Rohini uh, indicated, um, LSC was a powerful enough uh, machine with high enough intensity that it could produce Higgs boson of mass all the way up to 800 GeV, maybe more, okay? And it would have a world record instant luminosity of 10 to the 34 uh, uh, per centimeter squared per second, okay? So either, and, and here is a graph, this is from 2007, uh, uh, from the, the technical design report of CMS, a similar one for Atlas, where you see here the mass of the Higgs boson um, that, that we would be hunting for and the luminosity, LSC luminosity that we'd need for a five sigma discovery, okay? And so uh, depending on which particular uh, Higgs final state you're looking at, uh, you, you, you could basically cover the entire range uh, up to the... Uh, 800 GeV. Uh, this is a similar graph which shows you again, these are the kind of graphs we have learned to make a lot in planning for Higgs uh, searches, which is again the Higgs mass on the horizontal axis and the significance of observation with 13 Westfam to Barnard data at 14 TeV. Okay. Uh, these were of course all simulations, but they kind of showed you that either CMS and Atlas would find Higgs, and if they didn't find Higgs, despite having this kind of capability shown in these two figures, then there would be signs of new underlying strong dynamics uh, in the same TeV range that would show up. So one way or the other, 
the electroweak symmetry breaking mechanism, how particles get their mass, uh, we would know about them either by finding the Higgs or not finding them. So this was the no-lose theorem that, that uh, Rohini explained so well. And so you can imagine on September 10, 2008, when LSE started the commissioning, the excitement all over the globe, not just at CERN, was extraordinary because uh, here was a machine where you could quickly understand the source of electroweak symmetry breaking. And if Higgs existed, Higgs boson existed, then after 44 years since the Higgs conjecture, uh, one would know fairly quickly whether Higgs boson was, um, or Higgs field, uh, was, was true or it was just the ether of the 20th century. Okay, so this is, was the reason for this tremendous excitement. And the world's eyes were on, CERN, were on CERN at that time. But then an incident happened just nine days after the start of LHC commissioning, okay, where a faulty electrical connection between uh, two interconnects shown over here, uh, so, so connecting a quadrupole with a dipole, resulted in an arc which punctured the, the helium, a cold mass, and that led to an uncontrolled release of helium from the magnet's cold mass into the tunnel. And the force of this was so strong that it, uh, uh, it caused mechanical damage to 24 uh, uh, dipoles and five quadrupoles. You can see uh, the damage on one of them uh, over here. Now, those of you who have been to CERN know how bustling it is with activity, but uh, that afternoon, CERN was probably one of the quietest places in Geneva. Okay. Now, CERN responded uh, very swiftly and very carefully. And uh, uh, the first thing was that uh, there would be a protection system in place. Uh, to make sure that such accidents do not happen again. So this would be a, a guarded restart. And that start, which would take about a year after repairs, uh, would happen at root S of 7 TeV, not 14 TeV. So basically, the, 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 the standing instructions were proceed with caution, do not break the machine again. Okay. But this had consequences for Higgs searches, uh, and, and they were pretty tremendous. So here is a graph um, on uh, center of mass energy in, in uh, hadron colliders. So here's Tevatron, and then um, I want to point out, these are we will talk about this, but these are various production uh, mechanisms for producing Higgs in PP or PP bar collisions. And this is the total cross-section in Pico Barn. And I want to draw your attention to this uh, part here and that part here. And what you see is that going to 7 TV meant a factor of three uh, smaller Higgs cross section. And then there was issue of uh, how, how strong will the LHC machine be pushed in its intensity. Uh, uh, and so, so that intensity profile was unknown. And so it started becoming apparent at that time that the Higgs hunt, which was supposed to be a quick sprint at the LHC, uh, may turn out to be a long marathon because of this factor of three loss here and, uh, and, and not going to 10 to the 34 in its luminosity. And so this... Uh, th this this caused uh, some despair. To add to this, Tevatron was on our heels, okay. And uh, in run two, they would collect all, up to about ten femtobarn of data. But uh, here is an interim uh, 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 plot from Tevatron shown in Morion two thousand nine, uh, where they excluded the sweet spot of Higgs discovery between 160 to uh, around 160 or 170 GeV. 
So, you know, with this luminosity and, and, and some sensitivity in the low mass region, uh, the fear was that Tevatron could actually eat LHC's Higgs lunch, okay, uh, which was a, a rather foreboding thought. But then, when the machine turned on uh, and started being recommissioned in 2000, in the late part of 2009 and, and in 2010, 2010 was basically a, a, a period over the machine physicists where checking out uh, the new machine and, uh, and the magnet protection system and such like. And so what you see here is the peak luminosity uh, of LHC uh, as a function of, uh, of time in months in 2010, 2011, and 2012. In my opinion, this is the graph uh, that made the Higgs discovery happen uh, at LHC. So in 2010, we were learning how to operate this machine and we're already reaching 10 to the 32 in peak luminosity. But then uh, things got better. I'll show you a little graph of uh, the table of what changed. But you can just see the in, on the same scale the, the, the way the instant luminosity just soared, okay? And at Chamonix, this is the annual retreat uh, of the LHC machine physicists. Uh, the word came that in 2011, they would be delivering, or at least planning to deliver, some, somewhere around three inverse femtobarn, one to three inverse femtobarn, but, but we knew that based on the 2010 performance, they would do more. Okay, so that was good news. Meanwhile, Atlas and CMS used the 2009 downtime to sharpen their analysis tools. And uh, many new algorithms came. One of them for CMS was global event description of particle flow, uh, which, which uh, gave a very nice uh, 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 a way to, to, uh, to classify different particles which are produced in PP collision. And then tau tagging in LHC, uh, a few years ago, people thought was just a very difficult task, but uh, uh, but uh, there were important gains in efficiency and uh, and of the tau tagging while keeping the fake rates down, and similarly B tagging with the silicon detectors was brought to a new art, a form of art or level of uh, performance. And so, with these these two things. The prospects for Higgs hunt brightened, okay, because each of these algorithms would be crucial for, for finding Higgs in its, in its decay. And so, at least in CMS, it was time to re-energize the Higgs team, which had kind of been disappointed and moved on to other, searching for other things, and develop a plan of Higgs search strategy and discovery for 70 EV with the cross-sections with three times less than the nominal 17 TeV. And, and this was a big effort in the, in the, in tw in the, in the fall of 2010 and uh, early part of 2011. Uh, I, I, I don't want to describe this too much, but this is a nice table which shows you the various parameters uh, that were tweaked in order to arrive at uh, at at the, uh, the the instantaneous luminosity performance that I I showed you a graph of, so basically more protons per bunch, more bunches, smaller bunch spacing, uh, more bunch squeezing, so with a beta star, in order to reduce the beam size at its interaction points to intensify the the collisions. And the detectors were ready to receive the fire hose of data that they knew was coming their way. Um, so I have to show you the CMS detector, which uh, Professor Worthy will speak a lot more of later today. Um, and uh, this, is a, this is a piece of art. Uh, it has an 80 million pixel camera. It takes pictures at 40 million hertz. 
and uh, it does a remarkable job of measuring, of identifying the particles um, that are produced in PP collisions and measuring their uh, momenta uh, with pre precision. ATLAS is the other detector which uses in several places very different technologies, but ultimately both ATLAS and CMS were born or were designed to have very similar capabilities and, and in 2009 it became very clear that this was the case. And so here there were two detectors which were competing um, for many things including this, the discovery of the Higgs. All right, so we have the machine, we have the detector. Uh, let's set up the landscape. So here is a, a, a graph of what was known. So here is the LEP limit, and here is the Tevatron exclusion by, uh, by, by summer 2010. And then all this range here and throughout here was where LHC was to hunt for uh, the Higgs boson. So LSC was basically designed to hunt anywhere between 110 all the way to somewhere around here, 800-900 GeV. There were indirect limits that uh, that Rohini mentioned, which came uh, from uh, from uh, uh, the fact that if Higgs boson existed, its presence in quantum loops would alter several calculable properties of subatomic particles, like their masses, couplings decay rates and scattering asymmetries. And uh, the dependence on the Higgs, for example, was logarithmic, so it was not pinpointing anything. But these in, indirect bounds, uh, which were derived from comparing precision electroweak measurements with standard model theory, uh, shown over here, uh, this is a fit to all the electroweak measurements from Tevatron and LEP. And, uh, what they indicated is that the Higgs uh, mass at 95% confidence level should be less than 161 GeV. This required that believing that there is, a, there is a standard model Higgs boson in the MISS. But LSC, I mean, regardless of, of these indirect uh, limits, as I said, LSC was going to search. It was designed to search or LSC did and the CMS Atlas detectors were designed to search in the entire mass range, okay? So this was not a constraint, it is just a, a, a statement of what we knew then. Okay, so when we collide protons in the LHC, uh, this is a schematic of what these protons are, uh, what they look like, what they contain, a bunch of valence, C quarks, and a whole bunch of gluons. And when you collide them at, uh, at, with a beam energy of 3.5 TeV, uh, this is the major mechanism by which Higgs boson is produced in these collisions. Okay, and this is the gluon fusion. It's the dominant Higgs production mechanism now, once Higgs is produced, it lives for a very short time, 10 to the minus 22 seconds, and travels the distance of about a proton radius, and then decays into a set of particles like WW or ZZ or BB or Tau or Gamma Gamma. It's the job of the detectors to reconstruct these things and then by through them, the Higgs boson. But this is not the only production mechanism at LHC. Here is the one that I just showed you, gluon fusion. There is the VBF production where W and Zs fuse into a Higgs uh, and produce two jets uh, in addition. This is VH and this is uh, a, a rather rare TTH uh, mechanism where you produce Higgs in association with two top quarks. Um, this, this graph just shows that uh, the largest production cross-section is of the, of the gluon fusion. And the next one is VBF, which is about an order of magnitude less, and then much lesser VH. And TT is so small that initially, uh, like in around 2009, 2010, we were not sure 
that because of his poor, very small cross section, we would ever find TTH. And, and, and as usual, they're smart people and we found it. And that's the story that you'll hear also in this conference. Now, each of these VBF, VH, and TTH have, uh, they, they, their cross sections may be small, but they have very characteristic signatures, okay? And, and therefore, they play a very important role in the characterization of the Higgs boson uh, during its discovery and, and subsequently. So now talking about what Higgs boson decays into, if you look at the entire mass range, the Higgs boson decays to the heaviest thing that it is kinematically allowed to decay into. So at, at what I call, what is called high masses at LHC, um, the Higgs boson would decay only into WW and ZZ, or predominantly into WW and Z and almost nothing else except uh, TTH once you pass the uh, die top threshold. But the most of the action is here in the low mass range. So if you zoom up over there uh, in this mass range, uh, you see several actors um, and where Higgs couples to BB bar, sorry, Higgs couples to BB bar and WW and ZZ and gamma gamma and tau tau. And so if you wanted to measure the Higgs boson coupling to a whole bunch of fermions and, and bosons, you would pray that the Higgs boson mass would be somewhere in this region rather than over here. So uh, with, with those two things, here is a, a, a table which shows you uh, what we were considering at that time. Uh, so here is Higgs to gamma gamma. This is the mass range over, uh, it is a good tool to hunt the Higgs boson. Number of events in five inverse femtobarn at seven TV is not very large, only 70. And, uh, but, but, but because of the precision electromagnetic calorimetry that is used in CMS and ATLAS, and because the entire Higgs to gamma gamma decay is reconstructed, the mass resolution is excellent, one to 2%. So this is a very precise probe uh, when, of, of what the Higgs boson mass uh, could be. It measures Higgs boson mass very precisely. It also has a lot of background, mostly coming from prompt photons, uh, which uh, uh, make it very difficult to find such a small signal over large backgrounds. Higgs to BB bar has the largest rate but uh, but it also has uh, missing particles in B decays, and so it doesn't have a very good mass resolution. And the number of events, once uh, you you go to the VH production mode uh, at 7 TV is just too few. And as I said, it has a lot of background from W and Z plus jets and top quark and such like. And you could just go down this list and you see two things, Higgs to gamma gamma, and Higgs to ZZ, where each Z decays into L plus L minus, um, they have the best mass resolution. And Higgs to ZZ to 4L can probe, can search for the Higgs boson over a very large mass rate, 110 to 600, unlike Higgs to gamma gamma. Higgs to WW has also a very large branching ratio. And so it can, it can look between 110 to 600 GeV for a Higgs boson. But because there are two missing neutrinos in this event, the entire Higgs uh, decay process chain is, uh, is, is not fully re reconstructed. And so the mass resolution in Higgs to WW is 20%, which is to say that if the Higgs is in the range of 110 to 600 GeV, Higgs to WW to 2L to nu rings the bell, but doesn't tell you where exactly the Higgs is because of this poor mass resolution and so on and so forth so this is this is uh, uh, what we had this is what we uh, planned as strategy for Higgs hunt and graphically um, right let's see yeah right 
And so graphically, this shows you, again, the Higgs boson mass range and then uh, the different decay modes that were deployed uh, to hunt for it. Because our, because our cross sections at 7 TV were so, so small, the idea was to use all of these decay modes, uh, uh, even some with very poor expected signal rate, uh, uh, just because if the information is, cor is, 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 is correct, then it adds to what we know about uh, where the Higgs boson could be. All right, so this was the search strategy. <clears throat> but um, as usual, such searches um, have a lot of background and, and mitigating those backgrounds is the uh, major challenge in Higgs discovery. And so this is a graph which tells you um, what this, the situation was so here is the total cross section at LHC over here, okay? And here, and this is in nano barns, and here, several decades below, is the cross section for producing Higgs boson of 125 GeV uh, in each of these three um, production modes. So, and, and all of this contributes in one form or the other to the background in the searches of, of Higgs boson. So one has to kill this background rather uh, um, in a very strong way. Now when you search for Higgs, uh, you have a signal and you have some background. Here is an, a simple example of Higgs to, to decaying into uh, four muons. Um, and uh, you measure the momentum of the muons and you get to the masses of the Z, or four vectors of the Z, and then you walk back to the, re -recon reconstruct the mass of the Higgs. And uh, if you're lucky, depending on what the Higgs mass is, you would get into a situation like this, where this would be a signal that you're looking for, and there would be some background. And of course, depending on the mass of the Higgs, the ratio of signal to background could be different, but they would both be there. And and the signal or or the the discovery would require having an excess over this brown stuff, um, uh, and that would be the discovery of the Higgs boson. So this is a very simple example where, uh, this is a golden mode where um, background is low, but uh, this is not so for, for other uh, final states. Um, but the name of the game is to search for an excess over background. To go back to that theme, uh, here let me show you some of the background processes uh, for say Higgs to ZZ channel over here. I think I'm right. And, and what you see here is the Higgs to ZZ cross section of 4.5 pico barn. And, uh, and, and this is one of the, the larger backgrounds here, uh, three to, Z to Jets, which is 3000 pico barn. W to L nu, which is uh, substantially more, and T T bar. Okay, so this kind of defines the 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 business that we have to get in to dig out a signal like this from all the contributing background shown here. Now I don't know uh, if you ever played this game of uh, you know where is Waldo. Sorry? These cross sections are at 7 TV? 7 or 8 TV? Uh, yeah, this, this is a 7 TV. 7 TV yeah. Right, so basically the idea is to, in, in, in this game, is to find this character over a lot of background. Okay? And you can spend hours trying to find where is Waldo in this picture. Okay? And uh, finding the Higgs is kind of like that, but substantially tougher. Because this crowd is much bigger when you're searching for Higgs, okay? Higgs is produced in about one in every 10,000, 10 trillion proton-proton collisions. So that kind of tells you the, the, the severity of the problem. And the way you find from such a background the Higgs boson 
is by playing a rapid fire game of 20 questions, which involves triggers and analysis strategy. So let me just show you an example. So we usually have a good idea of the signature we are looking for. For example, if you're looking for Higgs to WW, where W decays into electron neutrino and muon neutrino, then we know that these events would look like this. Okay, they would have a uh, energetic muon and energetic electron. They are neutrinos, so they'll be missing energy. And then of course, there will be some remnant of the PP collisions. But this is what would be a Higgs to WW signal. Okay, furthermore, if Higgs is a scalar uh, and has spin zero, then the leptons which are produced in the decays of the WWs are, are, are aligned. And so the angle between the two leptons would not be large, okay? Especially for low, low mass Higgs. But here is how you start killing the background. One of the larger backgrounds is from PP to Z plus jets, okay? And so this also has two muons or two leptons, but it doesn't have any missing energy. And so by looking for absence of missing energy, you can reject uh, a, this very large background. Another one is, uh, is from a TT bar that uh, here again, you get the canonical two uh, leptons and there is missing energy, but now you have extra jets, which, which you can B tag. And if you find two of them, then you know that this is not a Higgs to WW. And that is the way that you get rid of this background. You veto out jets which have B hadrons in them. And then there is the irreducible background which you can't do much about, which is just uh, WW production uh, in PP collisions. And uh, this is what it would look like. Uh, but because it is not coming from Higgs, uh, the angle between the azimuthal angle between the two leptons would be very large, and that is one way of uh, of, of rejecting such events. So, the backgrounds do have their characteristic features, which you can use to eliminate them. And this graph tells you how we succeed in doing that. So here I have a, as in the game of twenty questions. Here I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to ask the event uh, that pass my initial selection. And as you can see, uh, they start off by, dom by being dominated by background. And then you ask a series of questions like in the event displays that I showed you. And by the time you get to about 10 or 15 questions, you get to this point where you have about say 200 background events. This is from simulations and you expect 40 Higgs events if the mass of the Higgs boson is 130 GeV. Okay, so this is how you play the game uh, to come to a place where you can begin to probe excesses in data over a well-represented or well-calculated uh, uh, estimate of uh, backgrounds. So, uh, this was, this was a graph that I made or, or that was made uh, back in 2012 to explain to people some of the, gra the, the, the plots that were commonly shown uh, during the Higgs searches. So this is rate of events on the vertical axis and is some parameter, okay? Some search parameter. And uh, this dashed line here is the expected background, uh, assuming that there is no Higgs boson, okay? So your data should, if there were no statistical fluctuations, should essentially line up along the expected background. If you had the Higgs boson, then there would be an enhancement that's shown in this green uh, curve over here. And let's say the data actually looks like that, okay? So how do you uh, take a situation like that and, and interpret it in terms of, uh, of what, where the Higgs boson could be and could not be? So now, again, mass of the Higgs is on this side. This is just a toy picture, it's not, not real. It's an, only an illustration of, of, uh, of, of the graphs that I'm gonna show several times during this talk. And this is a graph of 95% observed limit on the cross-section in units of the standard model cross-section. 
okay? And, uh, and what you see here in dashed again is the background. And uh, let's say that the black line here is the observed, okay? And so ideally that black line, if there was no Higgs, should sit on these dashed curves. But because of statistical fluctuation, it doesn't. If there is a Higgs, it would not sit on this background curve. There would be an excess. Um, and there could also be a deficit, uh, uh, you know, if there is a fluctuation in the, in the background. Okay. This is, this is the line which defines what can be, uh, where the Higgs boson can be ruled out. So anything where the black line is below the red line over here can be excluded. So this region is excluded because it falls below one and then similarly over here, but in this region you see some sort of an excess uh, which, which, can, um, which can mean something <clears throat> if it is not a fluctuation. The other uh, thing is um, uh, once you see an excess, then uh, how do you quantify the observed excess? So excess can be due to a real signal, which you would hope, or a fluctuation of background with respect to estimated value, okay? Uh, and so we calculate local p-value, which is the probability of a background fluctuation. So it measures the consistency of data with background-only hypothesis, meaning no Higgs. And the probability of a background fluctuation, the significance of that probability can be expressed in terms of the standard deviation of a Gaussian distribution. And so if this is the Gaussian distribution, uh, and then uh, here is the relationship between the, uh, the uh, significance in terms of Z sigmas, one, two, two and a half, and the p-value uh, that is observed in data. Now in particle physics, you need to have a p-value significance of five sigma. So you have to demonstrate that the fluctuation probability of background uh, is, is less than one in three into 10 to the six or three million. Um, and, and, and this is, as I said, uh, the required for the claim of discovery in particle physics. But the p-value does not tell you whether the excess is consistent with the standard model Higgs boson rate. And so we also report the best fit values of signal strength modifier, which is, which we call mu, which I just showed you in the previous graph, which is the observed cross-section uh, uh, divided by the, the uh, standard model Higgs cross-section. Okay, so th that was in passing so that you understand the, the, the graphs um, that I'm about to start showing now. So 2011 was the most interesting period in the, uh, uh, in the discovery of the Higgs because we first learned both ATLAS and CMS how to cope with uh, the large amount of data that, uh, that, that LSE was, was sending us and um, and, uh, and you can see here how the luminosity of the data that we were taking rose over the course of, uh, of 2011, okay? And there were two intermediate points. We had enough, about one inverse femtobond data by EPS, about 1.6 by lepton photon, and, uh, and about 5.5. Remember, let's see, it promised three. We got 5.5 inverse femtobond. Um, and with just a small fraction of this data, so data taken till say about here, uh, here is a graph, again of sigma over sigma standard model, the 95% confidence limit, showing you that, that one line and showing you the expected background rate and, uh, and the data. And you can see that between here and there, uh, the Higgs boson could be ruled out uh, between 141 and 476 degrees. So this whole vast region was ruled out at 95% confidence level.
Now, here was the first time when Atlas and CMS combined their results to rule out this region. And the, the, the pattern from both Atlas and CMS was, was the same. The bottom line is now Higgs boson, if it existed, is trapped between here and here. Okay, so this is where the, the next set of activity was to try and narrow this down and, uh, and see what we find. So with the full data set of about five in this femtobarn, uh, CERN uh, organized a public uh, presentation of 2011 results. And this is just about a month after the data taking had finished. And so we had to go through the whole analysis review and everything uh, by this date. And what was shown what from CMS was this. So again, now we are limited into the, the low, the, the, the massive region, which has already been, uh, was not excluded or close to that. So between 110 to 160 GeV. And uh, you again see the same graphs. This is the line one. And what you begin to see, this is one sigma, this is two sigma, and you begin to see that there's an enhancement. Uh, uh, and the and the p-value of that excess, most of that excess is over here, and the p-value is around, uh, um, uh, is it, such, it corresponds to about two point something sigma, uh, 2.6 sigma. Actually, we saw these graphs in the Director General's office two days before the public presentation and uh, in a show and tell between Atlas and CMS. And uh, we were pleased to see that the excesses uh, uh, were happening in the same places with uh, p-values which were uh, uh, quite similar. Okay, so there's some activity happening here and also in CMS and also in the case of Atlas. Okay, so so this you know if if you just look at these distributions, uh, you can pretty much say that there is a, a a significant activity happening around 124 to 126 GeV. Okay, <clears throat> but individually for each of these experiments, the CMS or Atlas, individually, if you correct for the look elsewhere effect because you're searching for Higgs in a in a in in a, a, a mass region, um, the look elsewhere effect. After you correct for that, the global significance of searches uh, from Atlas was only two point three sigma, and CMS was one point nine sigma. So that's far from five sigma. So you could not claim um, um, a discovery. But the as I said, the coincidence of access that both Atlas and CMS were seeing in this region was very intriguing. But the statements from Atlas and CMS on, on, on that day of CERN Jamboree was, uh, was very guarded. And it basically said, we don't know uh, whether this, is, uh, this excess is because of a fluctuation of background or something, a buildup of signal. Uh, but we do know that if it is signal that we won't have to wait very long for enough data and we will be able to resolve this puzzle in 2012. And similarly from Atlas uh, saying we need additional data delivered in 2012 to definitely give an answer. But we kind of knew at this point, I mean, in retrospect now, that what we were seeing here was the birth of the Higgs boson, okay? Although we could not statistically on statistical grounds made that claim. Uh, but the coincidence was remarkable. So all eyes turned to 2012. 2012 uh, data came even faster and at a higher energy, so 8 TeV, which meant that the cr Higgs cross-section was up by about 25%. And the luminosity uh, was, uh, this is you must have profiled during 2012, but well, we didn't need all that. As a matter of fact, we just needed till this much, June 12th. And uh, so this is the data set from 2012 
along with the data set from 2011, adding up to about 10, 10 and a half inverse femtobarn, uh, that became the discovery data sample. So 5.1 inverse femtobarn at 7 TeV and 5.3 at 8. And so this was the data set to see if what we saw in 21 was the birth of the Higgs or just a cruel statistical fluctuation in both experiments. So one by one, we go through the, the, the modes. So here, for example, Higgs to WW, which has the largest search range. Uh, and uh, so again, here is the Higgs mass and here is this familiar 95% limit on mu. And what you see here is the data is riding uh, a little bit higher than what uh, just background prediction would say in this region, okay? And remember, Higgs to WW doesn't have good enough mass resolution, so it cannot pinpoint whether the excess is here or it's over here. In fact, the wavelength, in some sense, of, uh, of this excess is about 20 GeV because of the poor mass resolution. But nevertheless, a small excess is seen at low masses, and then you play the same game with all other decay modes. The statement? Yes, please. The, the wavelength or something you said? Yeah, so so if you if you so in if if you sim if you inject a signal at uh, let's say Higgs mass of 130 GeV, okay, and then look for it because of missing neutrinos, you you, you don't have a very uh, good resolution on the mass of the Higgs, and so the Higgs boson mass uh, the the excess would show up anywhere over this plus minus 20 GeV range. It's, it's just a it's a, just a statement that the uh, uh, the mass resolution in Higgs to WW to two L two nu is very poor. Okay, thank you. Okay. So these are all, in some sense, drops in the bucket. Some are big and some are small, and uh, if you put them all together by combining them into one grand plot, as we have done in the past. Uh, here is the uh, situation. This is the line one, okay, and anything below that is ruled out. And what you see is everything until about 600 GeV is ruled out, and there's a one tiny, very concentrated region where there is an excess. So everything between 110 to 122.5 and 127 to 600 is ruled out. So now Higgs has to be, if it exists, between 122.5 and 127 GeV, okay? So at this low mass, what does the Higgs boson decay into? So this is a pie chart which tells you uh, what it can decay into. As I already indicated before, it, de it can decay into several final states and uh, predominantly BB but because of QCD backgrounds, uh, just searching for Higgs to BB in, in gluon fusion is, uh, is, is, uh, is not feasible. Uh, but, but here are the others which are the main players, WW, Gamma Gamma, um, Tau Tau, ZZ, um, and these are the five big ones for Higgs mass of 125 GeV. Now Higgs to BB, as I said, you don't use gluon fusion, you use uh, recoiling Higgs against a W or a Z. And this is what that looks like. So Higgs to BB bar means that two jets, one B jet, the other B jet. And here, for example, if you have a Z, then Z, Z goes into new new. So there's missing energy. And you see whopping missing energy of 243 GeV. And so these are the kind of events that we are looking for which have fewer background than, than uh, other uh, modes. But, uh, but there's a price to pay, as I showed you, that the cross-section for these things is much smaller than vector uh, gluon fusion. And so uh, while we made a lot of progress, there wasn't enough sensitivity uh, in this mass range from Higgs to BB. But this is what it looked like. So it needed Higgs to BB uh, would need much more luminosity in order to f for this to fall below the 
the one line, the, the red line here. Tau Tau, uh, which was once thought impossible, searching for Higgs to Tau Tau. Uh, again, here, by a vector boson process where you have two jets um, in association with Higgs decaying into Tau plus Tau minus, which kind of looks like this. So here is one jet, and here is another jet at high rapidities. And um, here is a muon from the Higgs, Tau decay to muons, and here is a tau which decays hydronically, and so you have to reconstruct these. Uh, they are missing energy in both tau decays, and you see that as 97 GeV. And so from all this, you can put together, not very precisely, but a mass of the Higgs boson. But that is still not enough because, again, of cross-section uh, limitations. So this comes to very close to the sense standard models. It came very close to the standard model sensitivity. So you can see one is here, and this at around 125 GeV is just skimming. So you can't exclude that um, from tau tau. But we then go to the uh, high resolution so-called golden modes, which reconstruct the Higgs mass very precisely. So here is Higgs decaying into a very energetic set of uh, photons which are captured in the lead tungsten state crystals of CMS um, or the electromagnetic calorimeter of Atlas and you reconstruct the four vectors of this to get the Higgs mass and then you just plot it you just plot the mass of the two photons uh, both in Atlas and CMS experiments and uh, and uh, so let's look at, at this picture here. Let's look at the Atlas one here. So this is a fit to the data. And, and what you see here is the parameterization of the background. And this has to be very precise. If you underestimate the background, then you may make a false signal. And uh, so here you see this tiny little bump over a very large background, both in Atlas and in CMS experiments. Uh, and so the, these are what I call the unweighted graphs. Um, you can also make weighted graphs uh, just for aesthetic reasons, and this is what they look like. Okay, but they, it is clear, whichever picture you look at, that there is an enhancement over the background only hypothesis. And that both Atlas and C, this enhancement around 125 and 125 GeV. Okay. Excuse me, I have a small yeah. question, if you don't mind. Yes, yes please. Thank yeah, thank you very much. So uh, for the Higgs uh, discovery, uh, they use this golden mode as a channel, right? You know, Higgs, to, Higgs going to four platforms, right? Isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm showing right now. Yeah, yeah. But at the, at the same time, the Higgs dominant decay is from the as a phase production, like now they uh, Z uh, star decaying to uh, W or Z to uh, and H, where H is uh, uh, even decaying to two B two B quarks. Now I would like my question is like now now driven driven by this golden channel, how we are going to uh, design the trigger menu for this the dominant channel? Like now, can you uh, uh, shed a light uh, on it? Because like now we were talking about like you know how we are going to discriminate like you now when particularly the, uh, 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 the the kinematic regions are overlapping how we can uh, uh, tackle the irreducible things but like you know at the same time you know uh, we have to understand like you know, how one can uh, come up with the effective trigger uh, trigger menus that you know, so that like you know, can maximize the uh, efficiency of identifying. So well, I'm sorry. What is the irreducible background final state yeah. you're talking about? You know, some they, for every signal channel, like there will be a reducible background and irreducible, irreducible uh, decay mode, which mimics the uh, signal process, right? For example. Yeah. So for example, uh, yeah. in by just looking at this picture, you can't yes. say that this could be a Higgs to uh, ZZ going to a muon pair, or it could be just PP to ZZ, where two Zs decays into a muon pairs. And I'll show you a graph 
of how much that background is. But you, 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 there is no, you cannot devise a trigger uh, in this specific case which uh, uh, excludes one or the other because it's an irreduc irreducible background. So by definition, you know, it's it's going to be there. Does that answer your question? Maybe if you wait for a, 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 a next, uh, like, next slide. Like, I think, because I, I remember all these things, like, you know, up until like 2013, 14, like, you know, all these plots are from that uh, time space. You know, I, could, I would like to really uh, understand, like, you know, because uh, whatever the trends yeah. that have been done, it's not in the channel of... Uh, uh, WZ. I mean, at that point of time, it's only after 2015, I think something in, in run two, I guess. So I would like to understand more uh, uh, comprehensively that, like, you know, uh, what is being done in uh, uh, this associate production mode as well as. Praveen, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Let him finish sure. this part first, which is from okay. the run one area, and then we come to your question. Sure, sure. Okay. Sure. okay, okay. So, so, so this is way... really beyond here. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, this is this is actually not uh, 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 VH production. This is just um, Higgs to ZZ in gluon fusion, for example. But in any case, I I, I think maybe this question can answer this this plot can answer your question. So in the case of Higgs to ZZ to four leptons, this is what Atlas saw uh, with the uh, the discovery data of 2011 and 2012. And, um, and uh, well, first of all, you see that there is an enhancement around 125 GeV in both experiments, statistically. These are few events. These are four or five events, okay? What you see here, um, and, and this turns out to be a nice calibration mode when, when the data samples grew, is when you have a Z which decays into four uh, muons, and that's what gives you this peak, which is the Z peak. And uh, because of different kinematic selections, the, the strength of these uh, peaks are different in CMS and ATLAS, but ATLAS sees it and CMS sees it too. And this is all coming from here. And then what you see here is, uh, is, is, the, is the irreducible background where you have just PP decaying into ZZ star. Okay, and this is something, this is the background over which you have to find a enhancement in order to claim anything um, in Higgs to ZZ. Okay, so again, the mass is at 125 GeV, you see excesses uh, in, a, in, in a substantially better signal to noise situation than Higgs to gamma gamma. So now let's put it all together and look at the p-values, uh, which characterizes these uh, excesses. So th let's start with ATLAS. This is ATLAS, which breaks up its data. Th these are actually graphs that take a while to, to, uh, to uh, process. But let me just point out that uh, here is Higgs to ZZ, ATLAS excess in Higgs to ZZ at four lepton. Uh, and you see this dip here. Uh, and then here is Higgs to gamma gamma, and you see that there's a similar dip, but more significant in Higgs to gamma gamma. And as I said, Higgs to WW uh, has a much too wide a, uh, or, or too large a mass resolution to, uh, to point at a, any particular uh, narrow mass range. And if you put it all together, Atlas uh, found uh, the significance of this uh, uh, of this uh, excess was six sigma. Similarly, Atlas here, and and of course, if you examine this carefully uh, later on, you'll see that uh, uh, these p values have been studied in both data samples, and 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 you see again it dip. Uh, in um, both 2011 and 2012 data. So these are kind of sanity checks that were done by the experiment. This is CMS. And uh, again, what you see is the significance of uh, observation and p-value on this side. And uh, 
and this is what CMS sees. Black line is the overall uh, p-value graph, and that gets to about five sigma. Uh, these are curves where you assume that the, there is, in your data, there is a standard model Higgs boson. So you can compare, say, at 125 GV, what you should have expected to see with what you actually do see. And they are more or less compatible in both ATLAS and CMS. Okay, and again here, like ATLAS, is a breakdown between seven and eight GeV. And uh, the overall significance of what CMS sees is five sigma, a little bit less than ATLAS. So, but these are independent and consistent results. Uh, to go with this p-value plots are, uh, are these mu plots, which is the observed cross-section in units of standard model cross-section of Higgs. And, and this mu basically is a scale factor which tells you by what factor uh, the standard model Higgs cross-section would have to be scaled up or down to best match the observed data. And so here for ATLAS as a function of mass of the Higgs is this signal strength factor mu which should ideally be at one. And, uh, and you see that it is more or less at one. It overshoots by a little bit. And in the case of CMS, it undershoots by a little bit, which is, which is uh, entirely possible and consistent. And so Atlas has a mu of 1.4 plus minus 0.3, consistent with one. And CMS has mu of 0.87 plus one is 23. You combine these two and you get much closer to a mu of one. But because Atlas has a larger mu, that also explains why the significance of their observation, remember six sigma uh, is larger than CMS, which sees 0.87 instead of one, and so gets only five sigma. So it all makes sense. And this shows you the anatomy of the excess, both in ATLAS and in CMS. And uh, uh, here is one, this is the standard model value. And within statistical errors, uh, this is all consistent with one, both in case of ATLAS and in case of CMS. Now, the both At ATLAS over here, this is Higgs to gamma gamma and CMS uh, saw a Higgs to gamma gamma rate uh, which was larger than the standard model value. So this is not one. And uh, this caused some excitement, but with some more statistics, just that same year, uh, this vanished. So mass of the re new resonance, again, to do this, uh, the real players are the Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to ZZ. And here's a graph of the signal strength in these channels uh, versus the reconstructed mass. And uh, you see Higgs to gamma, gamma is this point here. Higgs to ZZ is here. They are kind of consistent between gamma, gamma and ZZ. Okay, and Higgs to WW, as I said, has very poor uh, resolution. So uh, it's all over the place. In this fashion, Atlas measures the mass to be 126 plus, or me measured the mass to be 126 plus minus 0.4. CMS, again, playing the same uh, game, sees Higgs to ZZ, which is here, this uh, uh, curve over here, or this region over here. Higgs to gamma, gamma is over here. There is fair overlap between those two, and uh, and this is the combined value from ZZ and gamma gamma, and that is 125.3 plus minus 0.4, similar statistical uncertainty as ATLAS. Okay, so what did we learn in this discovery phase? So these are the facts. While searching for the standard model Higgs boson, ATLAS and CMS independently discovered a new resonance with a mass of about 125 GB. At that time, we were hesitant to call this resonance Higgs boson. 
the, 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 the closest we went was calling Higgs light boson. So the Higgs light boson resonance that we saw had a mass of about 125 GeV. And you look at the ATLAS and CMS results, the probability of seeing a background fluctuation is just remote, okay? So this is not an issue. Uh, because this particle decays into two photons, L landau yang theorem tells us that this particle uh, cannot have spin one. It's a small exercise that you can do for yourself to convince that this is indeed the case. And so uh, in this discovery, what we have found is this particle is either a scalar or a tensor. And the production rate and decay into gamma, gamma, zz, and ww is compatible within errors with the expectation from the standard model Higgs boson. But what, but what you, we could not observe was this in Higgs boson decay in BB and Higgs to tau tau, and this was uh, an important part of what remained to be discovered after the discovery itself. So this was enough to make an old man cry. And uh, this is Peter Higgs in the, uh, um, at the CERN auditorium. And uh, of course, he got a Nobel Prize for it. And so that was the story of uh, the discovery, but there was work that remained to be done, which is to, to uh, measure the spin parity and uh, this is this can be done in Higgs to ZZ, WW, and gamma gamma decays by looking at the kinematics and angular distributions uh, in these final states. So, for example, if you take Higgs to gamma gamma, the way you tell from a zero, so you look at the the the, the decay angle of the photon in the Colin Sopper rest frame, and you see a flat. This is what you expect if it is a, a standard model Higgs, and this is what you expect if it's a tensor. Uh, a minimal tensor like model um, and then uh, there are sorry this is for yeah the graviton or the minimal 2 plus m model and this is for some other uh, high model with higher dimensions and so you can see that you can always tell between this kind of distribution from this and from that and this is what was used to test for the hypothesis in the data uh, of what this particle uh, spin parity could be. So here is a comparison uh, for between a pseudoscalar, which would be that if you did several experiments, then your results would kind of tend to line up within this blue region. And if it is the standard model, then this would be Higgs with zero plus, then it'd be over here. And this is the data in the case of CMS, uh, which says that it is more, much more likely to be a a zero plus than zero minus. And similarly, this is how you distinguish between a, a tensor model, and there are many tensor models, and I just picked one uh, for, uh, for brevity. And uh, this is the standard model, and you can tell that the data likes to be much more standard model than some kind of tensor. So the pseudoscalar and tensor are disfavored. As a matter of fact, this is some of the early data Subsequent data, a uh, uh, lot more models were tested. And by doing this hypothesis testing and contrasting the distributions uh, for different models, uh, we, we, we have con concluded that Higgs 25 is, is a spin zero particle of the standard model. All right, so that's good. Now, what about fermions? So as, we, as I showed you before, because of poor yields, uh, the, the, the observation of third generation fermions would require much more data, which we got not only in 2012, but subsequently. And so one by one, all the three generation fermions came to play. Uh, so here is the graph of the reconstructed tau tau mass uh, from CMS. And what you see here in the N set is the background and the signal. This, this is how you observe Higgs to tau tau at a five standard deviation level with about 36 inverse femtobarn of data. <clears throat> this is a plot of Higgs to BB or mass, the invariant mass of BB. 
And uh, what you see are two distribution here is Z, which is after background subtraction, these are Z, which decays into BB bar. And, and this is where the Higgs uh, of 125 GeV would show up as an excess. Um, and, and this is how we observe the Higgs to BB bar. Similarly, this is from Atlas and at CMS did uh, similarly. I'm trying to give preference to who got to five sigma first. And you can see here, Atlas got to Higgs to BB bar first, but not by much. And then uh, this is very important for measuring the Yukawa coupling of Higgs to the top. This is TTH, a, a, a uh, observation we never thought would be possible back in 2008. And, uh, and it, was, it was found uh, rather remarkably um, with about not just the, the run one data uh, of 2011 and 2012, but the first part of the 20, run two data uh, at 13 TV, and and you can see this excess, um, which uh, denotes a five sigma observation of TTH. And so the third generation has now completely come into view with much more data. These measurements have become statistically much more uh, precise, but these are the first observations. And you know, first observations always matter the most. What about second generation? Uh, Vivek, because, I'm sorry to interrupt, just to remind you of time. Yeah. Yes. So this yeah. I'm almost at the end. Okay. Okay. So because of the small masses, fermions of the second generation couple very feebly to standard model Higgs compared to say, Higgs, you know, Higgs to the, the, the top quark, and uh, and and so there is possibility for additional BSM Higgs, which doesn't get to say loudly. Uh, in the Higgs to top interaction here, or the, the top quark mass, it can contribute um, much more uh, to the masses of the second generations. Um, and so, so the second generation is an excellent laboratory for testing deviations from standard model Higgs coupling, okay? And to do that, the most accessible uh, final state is Higgs to mu mu, but, but it is not easy. The Higgs to mu mu has a branching ratio of about 10 to the minus 4 at 125 GeV, which is 10 times smaller than Higgs to gamma gamma. And I just showed you uh, how poor the signal to background is in just Higgs to gamma gamma. So you can imagine the mu mu situation is a challenge. And a challenge it is. So here is the background description. Most of the background is Drell Yan. Okay, so Z star to mu mu gamma. And uh, but 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 again, you you have to be careful about how you model the background, and then you begin to see the rise of a small signal at three sigma level in the case of CMS, about two sigma for Atlas, um, and the mu is about one, okay, so uh, quite consistent with the standard model um, expectation. Now this is this is a graph that we have worked for ten years to produce, okay? And this is a graph of particle masses starting all the way from muon going all the way to the top. And uh, and, and this is the uh, mass, and this graph basically shows you the mass dependence of the Higgs coupling. Kf or Kv are just uh, scale factors, which would be one if, uh, if our data indicated couplings which were, which were consistent with the standard model. And you can see how beautifully all data lines up um, in this graph over here. If you look at the residuals of the ratio to standard model, so this would be kappa, then you see that uh, uh, with much better statistics here and with growing statistics over here, um, the couplings is, is very consistent with the standard model. So one can now say that to a high level of measurement accuracy, the Higgs 25 is the standard model Higgs boson. Uh, the BSM Higgs searches have been produced in various scenarios, but have been done in various scenarios, but not found yet. So let me finish here with a summary that despite the early setback, the Higgs discovery came just 30 months after the LHC commissioning at uh, root S of 900 GeV. And this is because of the heroic 
it's truly heroic effort of LHC machine folks um, and, and, and the ingenuity of Atlas and CMS scientists who learn to harvest data at much smaller cross sections um, and finish the Higgs search as a thrilling sprint and not the dreaded marathon. And since then, Higgs spin and coupling to third and second gen fermions have been measured and a precise portrait of the Higgs boson is in hand. Uh, with run three and beyond, the major challenge, which I did not discuss, but you will be discussed at this conference, will be to probe the Higgs self-coupling via dye Higgs production. And this is the most challenging Higgs physics that uh, will be taken on in run three and, and high luminosity LHC, and it's, it's an important part of the LHC program. So let me uh, end by saying that I hope to collaborate with you in the next part of the Higgs journey, and, uh, and thank you. Thank you very much, Vivek, for such a nice story of how the Higgs was discovered and beyond. So we can take a few questions. I see Manas, please go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, uh, this is uh, a postponed question from uh, Rohini's talk, uh, yeah. but uh, maybe it can be addressed by both of you. Uh, the thrilling discovery of the Higgs uh, effort, isn't it a bit disappointing that it's too standard model-like and it is no deviation from uh, or any indication for what could be the standard beyond standard model physics? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, <laughs> you you can't question nature, okay? It is what it is. <laughs> but I so think what would you? I would like to say the following. I mean, which I think also was clear in Vivek's question, is that LHC and the measurements that people suggested, the phenomenologists and what the experimentalists could do. To me, it's amazing that already one is able to say so clearly that it is the standard model Higgs. I mean, I can tell you, and I think Vivek will say yes to this, that nobody really thought that the CP measurements, the CP value, eigenvalue of the Higgs, whether it's a CP eigenstate, and there is that it would be possible so soon after the discovery. And it just, you know, to me, it's amazing to think that a complex machine like LHC, with all its entailing theoretical uncertainties, we have been able to combine the theory and the experimental efforts to come with this profile. And I think that is perhaps, the, that gives you confidence that if there is something else, you will find it. You need to look at the precision measurements. And if nature says that there is nothing else, we'll have to, and that is what my last slide was actually indicative of that the region where we are finding the Higgs indirectly is perhaps telling us that there is no, at least in the standard, in the normal sense, I, we don't seem to be able to see no physics scale, uh, physics at low scales, BSM physics scales, uh, the physics at low scales doesn't seem to be out just on the mass itself. At least that would be my uh, take. Sima, uh, allow me uh, one more minute. I mean, given that we have the LHC at this moment and uh, no new machine uh, in near future, where would you look in the Higgs sector signals or signs of new physics? As I, I think, said, I think... trying to measure the couplings. Yeah, well, so I mean... I will mean... like answer it differently, but my judgment is measure the top Higgs uh, sector more accurately, study that. There are still possibilities there, though they are getting... There, again, the regions are get, allowed regions are getting ruled out. And also the point really is that we don't have a principle anymore, which will tell us what to expect. Yeah. So I think as far as Higgs coupling is concerned, uh, the projections are that, uh, and maybe Jim Olson in his colloquium will expand on this, uh, are, are getting quite precise and, and in several cases, one could measure these couplings with a precision of three to four percent. Yes. Okay. And and I think it, and and so if there are deviations, they have to be at that level. But uh, for me personally, 
the place where I and I'm working on it is is in uh, a measurement of uh, dye Higgs production. That okay. of course, yeah. yes. Where, where, where you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very razor's edge over which the standard model cross section is balanced. And so, if there is an intervention from new physics, you can see remarkable changes from the predictions uh, for this self coupling, right? So, th yeah. that yeah. that's where I personally would go and look for. Is not look for a small yeah. number. But in run three, you have enough data, and we have made substantial progress, um, as as you will see in in in, in a, another talk uh, in this conference. So we have we have we have pushed down the limits quite substantially with just run two, which was also unexpected. And in run three, continuing that probe and looking for anomalous enhancement. I mean, to answer your question, Manas, is, would be how I would bet on where to look for new physics. Actually, okay, that's, thanks, a, that's a very good point, Vivek, you made. I, normally, I would have made that point in my general talk of Higgs future. And at this moment, I was disconnected from it. But yes. OK, so we'll move ahead. Um, Kajuri, you have a question. Please go ahead. The student who wants to give him, ask a question. I'll give yeah. it to Saikat Karnakai. So it's from Sure. So you showed that Tevatron excluded the Higgs mass from 154 to 170 or something. So why it could not exclude the mass below that? Uh, you have to tell me which. Yeah, I think it was in the beginning of your talk. Yeah. I think it was the 2009 and 10 uh, exclusions of Tevatron. Sorry, I could not remember the slides. Yeah, so that was... Uh... Then LHC was getting uh, slide released. 13 yeah. or after that, yeah. Right. So what is the... The question is why Tevatron could not look for the Higgs, low mass Higgs. Why Tevatron was on the sensory... Yeah. Uh, okay. I, as a matter of fact, uh, if I can ever get to that slide... Um... I think it's 13 or before. The next one. Right, this one. So, so you see yeah. here, I, I didn't expand on this because I was setting up the 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 the, the Higgs chase in 2010. But uh, in 2010, this is what we had: Tevatron exclusion. Okay, because th this is again that red line one. Similar units. But you can begin to see that around 125. There is uh, this is data. This is background. There's some sort of enhancement which is away from the background expectation. Okay. Now this grew later on, um, and since I was asked to to talk about LHC discovery, and I didn't have time to to talk about this, but uh, right around the time I believe it was uh, Morion 2013, uh, Tevatron actually. Uh, uh, by combining the CDF and D zero results, I think they they uh, they claimed a uh, an evidence for Higgs to be be uh, consistent with 125 G. But they also have the same problem, which is that the you know you, you don't reconstruct Higgs to BB the way you reconstruct Higgs to gamma gamma, and the mass resolution in the reconstruction of the the B jets is. Uh, is about 10%. And so you never get a very sharp enhancement, uh, but uh, they did claim an enhancement of about uh, two and a half, three sigma. So, and also if you see, this is also the region below the LEP exclusion that they had ruled out. So, so they were in the game and we were very <laughs> concerned that uh, they could, if the Higgs was, I mean, it already, they excluded this region, which is the the, the 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 sweet spot for Higgs to WW. And we were concerned that if they had started seeing an enhancement, they would basically eat our lunch. They would discover for that period in 2010, oh. Tevatron would discover Higgs before LHC. In fact, I don't know whether you remember, Vivek, that the day before the 4th of July seminar, there was a Tevatron seminar. Um, yes. 
uh, giving these uh, some of these results in yes. fact yes yeah. actually i can extend this question slightly more for the so students that why the heavy mass Higgs were quickly ruled out while we had to wait for the low mass Higgs, right? Although the cross sections are high for the low mass. Yes. Uh, so that's a good question. And the reason for that is that uh, 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 let, let me try to get to this region, this one here, right? So this this kind of kind of tells we you. We don't see your slides anymore. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have. So to... I think you mistakenly stopped sharing. Do you, do you see it now? Yeah. All right. So now look here. Expected signal at seven TV. Just sort of a ballpark of where the events would be. Okay. And you can begin to see that there is a, a pretty large signal for Higgs to WW uh, and for Higgs to ZZ to 2L2Q, where Z decays into uh, QQ bar. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good number of events. And because at high mass it is the WW and ZZ uh, is where Higgs decays into, uh, you, you start winning, okay? And you start winning uh, with uh, relatively uh, modes with poor signal to noise like Higgs to ZZ to 2L. Actually, this is the more important one, Higgs to ZZ 2L to nu. Uh, it's pretty clean, has a reasonable mass resolution. And, and so this region got carved out early. Once you get over here, uh, gamma Higgs to WW loses its potency because because now you have a lot more background okay at high mass little background because it's high mass so you know face is not letting background get there or overwhelm that region but what as you move slide back to the lower and lower mass higgs then uh, everything gets complicated if you come too close to higgs to z then your gamma gamma uh, uh, starts picking a background but higgs to WW is the most affected because all kinds of backgrounds start rising, okay? And so it loses its potency there. So in the low mass range, you're only left with Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to ZZ to four leptons. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so the standard model process becomes more and more like Yeah, you're, 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 you're coming, yeah I mean, the, the standard yeah. model is coming in as a wall yeah. around 115 GV. See, see, just, I can add one more thing about the Tevatron searches. Tevatron, who came in, was basically looking the associate production of the Higgs with the uh, with the vector boson. Right. And that is that is why why you come in there could look at the BB bar only. And obviously, what uh, Vivek has said, you come in uh, if the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the mass resolution is poor. Yeah. Uh, and, the thing is, okay, I mean, from that point of view, LSE was much richer, okay, from the point of view, okay, they could put, put at the ground ground fusion, okay, not just the acid production, okay, so. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, but, but also, I mean, there was, the Tevatron did have an advantage because they were looking for, uh, and because they had a PP bar, right? So, so their VH searches uh, yes. We're better placed than, you know, any search at LHC for Higgs to BB with, say, gluon fusion, which is almost impossible, okay, at, at yes. that mass. And, and, and if you're, un I mean, now people have started looking at very high PT production of Higgs to BB, but in, in the general scene, when you're in discovery mode, I mean, just the background was way too much, okay? So, so yes. their Tevatron at low, very low mass was was indeed a threat. Okay, thank you, uh, Nishita. I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Yes, I had a question about uh, the future. Actually, so we are now starting uh, collisions at the LHC at thirteen point six. Uh, so I wanted to ask, what is the approved lum uh, integrated luminosity currently for 13.6? And is there a physics case that you would expect to be enhanced by running at this energy? 
uh, is there any advantage to that? Well, I mean, I there are there are uh, these projections are uh, contingent of how many years uh, the run three will last. Okay, uh, but it is I mean, from what we have seen of uh, of uh, LSC so far. Uh, I'm, Take, for example, a, a, a measurement which is only an evidence right now, which is uh, uh, Higgs to mu mu. It's only a three sigma, um, and uh, we would like to get it to five sigma. And, and that would require that, uh, that run three give us a little bit more than double what we have collected already. And I think that is well within the cards of... Uh, of uh, uh, of run three. Uh, uh, I think uh, searching for anomalous uh, uh, Dye-Higgs production is another place where uh, run three comes in, uh, uh, can play an important role. So from Higgs point of view, those are uh, that and then uh, other searches where Higgs uh, is a tool for uh, for search for beyond standard model. I did not talk, for example, about Higgs to invisible, which is a, a, a very interesting and very challenging um, uh, uh, way to use Higgs as a portal to dark matter. And uh, where we have a lot of uh, leg room, I mean, we, we can improve our uh, sensitivity to uh, Higgs to invisible uh, substantially during run three, okay, and uh, and th so th so these are the sort of examples which motivate why run three would be uh, even more fun than run two. Actually, so it would be. I am glad to mention the the but would, so wouldn't TT like, bar Higgs also be equally exciting? Actually. Uh, TT bar Higgs, we are making a lot of progress already. Exactly, and that would something run three would. Really, you know, TT bar Higgs will come into its own. Yeah. Yeah. And this interplay between the top and the Higgs sector, I mean, which from a theory's point of view, just like lambda, the self-coupling, this is another place where, uh, you know, it might be like looking under the lamp. I mean, for me, you have mentioned two things looking for BSM physics, one which is lambda, the other is invisible Higgs. And I feel TT bar Higgs, would be the third place and which uh, run will help us there. I, 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 fully, I fully agree with you, but I mean, right now there's a lot of momentum which is building um, uh, around TT Higgs. I mean, to look for TT Higgs where Higgs, to, Higgs goes to gamma gamma, that is already mm -hmm. me. It is, I'm trying to look for that graph which uh, would show you um, you see, th this is this is pretty recent. This is run two, first year of run two, and uh, but you can see the. I mean, the, as we stay, take more data, as Rohini is saying, you know, this picture, the measurement of the coupling would become much more precise, and uh, and so that's definitely and, part of the. And of the for menu. the BSM physics, you know, the basically what you want is the spectrum in the large PT for the Higgs, large PT for the top you know, large invariant masses, uh, and that would all become more and more accessible when you have more and more data such that this thing sharpens up. Yeah, for example, looking for, you know, even in gluon fusion, looking for Higgs to BB at very high PT, okay, greater than 300 GeV or so, and searching for enhancement there is uh, another strategy of looking for BSM physics, which would uh, benefit from run three. And beyond. So that that's one part of it. And the second part is that, uh, which is more sociological, which is that, you know, run three, uh, the end of run three will be followed by a large uh, period of shutdown, right? And so run three is the opportunity to collect as much data as possible, you know, so, so that some of you mm -hmm. can you know, write your thesis and get on. With your life, right? So, so there's a sociological aspect of it too, which is to get it while you can before yeah. you have a shutdown, and uh, and 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 then wait for the restart of uh, high luminosity LHC. Yeah. 
and so also with a reasonably understood system yes the detector hi uh, can you hear me yes, yes. so yeah. ram yeah. please quick one yeah so regarding so somebody who has already like worked on tth search so in this round like we will be looking into eft interpretations of uh, tth as well besides the precise measurement of the coupling in simplified template cross section that's what i meant actually yes. with when i yeah. talked about the large pt I, I, yeah i i think i think that 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 is a uh, uh, the the you know the effective field theory approaches uh, have started but i think run 3 data would be uh, would be the period over which they would shine i mean they would come into prominence um and uh so yes kajuri you seem to have a question yeah, yeah, yeah just before ahead. we you finish it, it is time to finish i wanted to answer to nishita's uh, question about the luminosity we expect about 150 to 165 one inverse in run 3 okay so same, and uh, pretty much same as run 2 i was yeah, i was wondering to, actually whether total, run 2 will total total run 1 run 2 one, run two is about uh, you can say of the same type so at the end of run 3 we expect about 300 from one inverse but the luminosity build up will be slow and this is what is being talked about and talking about invisible hicks it will come up tomorrow in robert salenor's talk i understand tomorrow afternoon and now that we if i can comment a bit more now that we know the some of the basic properties of hicks more data will allow us to do much more differential distributions which will be very interesting that's all i wanted to say yeah. thank, thank you kajuri so Okay, so if not further questions, I think we should wrap up here. And I think we are holding people for their lunch and also a week to sleep probably for some time at least. Thanks a lot before the day begins. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Vivek and Rohini. Thank you, Sima. And we will meet again at two thirty p.m. Two thirty is. Yeah, and we continue with our interesting discussion. So please join us back after your lunch. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye.